Hey everyone, this is Alan McKay. This is episode 48. I'm interviewing Bo Pushal, the president of TurboSquid. So let's do this. Welcome to the Alan McKay Podcast. Alan is an Emmy Award-winning visual effects artist and mentor to many leading industry experts. Listen in as Alan talks with other industry leaders in film, video games, and visual effects about their experience, lessons, and methodology. Alan will teach you pivotal advice to fast-track your career, better your skills, and reach your ultimate dream job. Check out the latest episodes on alanmckay.com. Hi everyone, this is Alan McKay. Welcome to episode 48, getting close to 50. And this episode is with Bo Pashal, who's the president of Turbo Squid. And we get into a lot of stuff. Uh, for me, it definitely was a bit of a, a trip down memory lane. We got to talk about a lot of cool stuff, as well as dive into Turbo Squid and some of the cool stuff they have coming up. But Definitely talking to, to Bo, who has such a massive, massive background in 3D. It was just really great to kind of be able to talk about a lot of things from, I guess, some of the politics of software through to uh, kind of more the origins of a lot of the tools that a lot of us use these days. And there's so much other stuff. He's such a massive wealth of knowledge. So I had a blast doing this. It was a lot of fun. Bo is a good friend of mine I've known for, God, uh, 11, 12 years at least. And uh, yeah, just really great stuff to get into. Before we get into that, though, I just wanted to mention a couple of things. So uh, one thing that I mentioned before was to follow me on Periscope because I'm going to start doing a few uh, live sessions here and there. And the good thing about Periscope is that it's not really something I'd, I necessarily schedule. I just literally log on. And if you're around, it'll pop up on your screen and ask if you want to join in. And basically, this is a chance to kind of interact with you guys live. And uh, it's pretty straightforward. It just means that I get the talk and people can chat and just ask questions or, or whatever. So I kind of think this would be a fun thing to experiment with. And I'm going to be doing it uh, a little bit towards the end of this month and next month as well. Just doing a few kind of uh, ask me anything kind of sessions about career related material and whatever else we want to get into. So uh, I think this would be a lot of fun and it should be a great new platform just to kind of share a lot of knowledge and interact with you guys. So I think this will be really cool. Um, I haven't done any sessions yet and I'm going to start um, probably next week. Uh, for me, I just kind of wanted to get back on track with the podcast with a lot of stuff before I kind of uh, start doing this. But for doing that, I believe, and I'll just need to double check what my Twitter handle is, but it uh, Periscope's owned by Twitter. So it's whatever your login is, you'll be able to find me. So mine is at Alan F.T. McKay. So Alan, A-L-L-A-N, F for Francis, T for Thomas, McKay, M-C-K-A-Y. I don't know why my mom decided to give me two middle names, but F-T. Uh, so Alan F-T McKay. And um, yeah, this is going to be super, super cool. In addition to that, I have a bunch of stuff coming up. Uh, the mentorship, I get so many emails uh, every week asking when it's going again. Uh, so far, we've ran the mentorship twice. Okay, so Christmas last year. I opened it up for one week and I had to turn people away because we had too many people uh, try and register. And I launched it again in May. And again, I only had, I gave one week because it seems to fill up at such a ridiculous speed that we never even make it to the end of the week. Um, the spots are pretty limited just because I want to give as much time as I can to everyone inside the mentorship. So because of that, um, I'm only allowing a certain amount of people in each time. And um, so naturally, after a couple of days, we're completely booked up. So I've been getting a lot of people asking, when is it going to happen again? And I've had to uh, basically say end of the year, um, you know, you're going to have to wait till then. And the best way to, to find out is to go on my insiders list. So if you go to alanmckay.com, slash inside and I'll leave a link to it 
But that'll be the best way to um, to sign up, and you get all this free stuff that I'm giving out. Uh, I, I write, I constantly contribute to that. There's a lot of things, most things that I actually build, I'm doing it more privately to that list because it's kind of a reward for people who want to um, to kind of take action and want to uh, to learn and, and get a lot from it rather than just firing out stuff to the web all the time. Um, now, the main thing about that is that I will always announce that the mentorship's coming up on the list first, usually a few days before anyone else. And, um, you know, that, that gives everyone a chance to sign up uh, ahead of time and then I'll publicly announce it. And by that stage, there's literally, you know, a few positions left um, by that point. So it's better to kind of get in early. And on top of that, I'm just constantly contributing to that. And one of the cool things I'm going to be doing, I didn't plan to announce this, but uh, I'm working on I'm working on so much stuff at the moment, but I'm going to put together a free DVD on Fume FX4. And this is something that at least for now, I'm going to be exclusively uh, releasing to everyone on the insiders list. And it's going to be um, just a kind of a bit of a crash course, but a chance for you to get into some of the Fume Effects 4 features. But I've also got so much other stuff coming up. I'm going to be talking a lot about pre-production. I'm going to be putting out content on um, a lot of like launching a studio. Uh, also, also a lot of career related material. There's so much stuff coming up and uh, all of it is going to be more specific to the insiders list so get on there it's free and you know for me it just means i've got my community that i i contribute to and this is what i put most of my time into so periscope okay that's alan ft mckay is my handle and that just comes from twitter it's my twitter handle uh and also get on the insiders list so alanmckay.com slash inside and those are the two things I wanted to mention that I think are really important, mainly because I, I'm basically spending the next two months gearing up for the, the next mentorship, but also going to be putting out a lot of really cool stuff. Um, I have something I've been working on for the past year, um, which I've now got a, a big team behind, and I've basically been putting together a film crew to uh, shoot pretty soon. And that's something I'm going to be announcing very soon as well. Um, and a lot of free content that's going to be derived from that will be on there as well. So either way, uh, yeah, I'm just really excited uh, because there's just so much stuff that I'm finally got time to do. I've been head down the entire year working on um, especially the mentorship and other stuff. And it's just been really fun, but uh, just easily the most demanding year of my life, probably because... I've contributed it all to something that I've just really wanted to make it the best experience possible. So I feel like I've done that. And um, now I can kind of start to focus on some of the other things. Now we're gearing up towards the end of the year. Okay, uh, I got loads of really cool episodes coming up, but I want to get started on this. Um, just as a heads up, I'm going to be speaking in Paris in March. And in addition to that, um, one of the episodes coming up is actually going to be my talk from Paris this year. So next episode, I'm going to be interviewing Next Limit, who are the developers of RealFlow. And the episode after that, I'm going to be giving my career talk that I gave in Paris, which was a lot of fun. Okay, so that's enough of me yapping on. Let's get into this. You know, I've been around, I've been, I started as a 3D artist. Um, actually, if you go back a little bit further, I started out wanting to do to be a cinematographer. Mm -hmm. So I I'd, I'd gone out to L.A. after school um, and tried my hand at that and was working on low budget, no budget films for a while and being a camera loader and assistant cameraman loading, mm -hmm. you know, Aeroflex cameras and spending my time out in Oxnard at Panavision and things like that. And I, at some point, I guess about six or seven months into it, I realized that people would rather see you get hit by a bus than have any degree of success. And I got kind of fed up with it. And I came back to New Orleans at that point and worked in video production, mm -hmm. doing everything from um, commercial editing um, at a place called Moxie Media to, you know, uh, working on reality TV shows like Real Stories of the Highway Patrol and Emergency Call. 
Um, yeah, I've had a gun pointed at me in the middle of the night. That was lots of fun. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you want to elaborate on that for a second? We were we were actually, it's funny, is that we were riding in with the EMS director, Emergency Management Services, one of the, the chief guys at night. And it was a Saturday night at like two in the morning. And we got a call into one of the housing projects. Mm -hmm. And you're not supposed to go in without police escort. And, you know, we get there. And, of course, there's no police. And there's a guy on the street. And he has obviously been injured. And the cameraman gets out of the front seat. I'm in the back. I've got the audio rig. So I've got the big you know, boom mic with the fuzzy yep, yep. end on it and my, the pack around my neck and I'm doing the, the dead cat. <laughs> right. Exactly. And I'm hearing. Psst, psst. Yeah. Sorry. Go yeah. ahead. Yeah. Motherfucker. Psst. I'm like turning the boom mic, trying to figure out what's going on. And suddenly this guy comes out of shadows with a shotgun. Wow. And he's, he's pointing it right at me and I'm tapping the cameraman. <laughs> who's turning <laughs> the look and is trying to stay clear of me. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> Suddenly, and, you're the reality TV subject. Uh, yeah, I am at that point just going, oh, my God. And the guy's like, if I didn't want that motherfucker dead, I wouldn't have shot his ass. Y'all going to leave, right? And I'm, and the EMS guy looks at all of us and goes, yep. And we got <laughs> in the car and we left. <laughs> and that was it. And, uh, you know, the, that's the kind of thing that just kind of makes an impression on people. Um, reality TV is not terribly real. Yep. Um, and so when I was working doing online editing, we had the choice of, cause this is all back in the beta SP days. This is early, early nineties yep, yep. and, no, um, no final cut pro. <laughs> oh, definitely not. No, <laughs> <laughs> I wish I think avid was the only thing that was out and it was ungodly, super expensive at that point and fairly slow. But Hey, you, you pay the money for the colored keyboard. So it all works out. <laughs> Actually, right. I'll, I'll just say like one of my best friends, he's, um, a casting director for like Jersey Shore and like a lot of other uh, big rowdy TV shows. And like, that's, you know, that's one of the things is the more I spend time with him, the more I'm like, wow, like I can't look at reality TV anymore. And oh, if, no. if someone like flips out and gets angry, I'm like, okay, did the producer run over and like, you know, mention like what the, you know, the guy just did to his wife or something just to get him fired up. So oh, yeah. Oh, it's ridiculous. Well, me. they're also paying off the families on the backside too. It's yep. the most, unsavory thing I've ever witnessed. It was awful. Wow. Um, but it, while I was doing online editing, we had an option to get another beta SP deck to do like ABC cuts and dissolves and picture in picture and all sorts of goofy stuff or a 3d animation system at the time. And mm -hmm. I was like, Oh, we're going 3d. And I, I lobbied very, very hard for that. And at the time the, my boss didn't want to spend uh, the entire farm to get, um, you know, an SGI machine. So we ended up getting a, an old 486 with 3D Studio DOS R2. So yep. that should really date me <laughs> Way back in like the early 90s, like 93 or so. And, um, you know, there wasn't any internet. There was no online. It was like you read the manuals cover to cover. I mean, I think they were dog-eared and whatnot. And I literally taught myself. And, and the, the 14 uh, floppy disks that it came on. Oh, God. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yes, that was crazy. Uh, yeah, that's in the days, I think, of still the five and a quarter inch floppies before they went to the yep. three quarter yep. inch. I, I, I'm just going to jump in and say that, like, um, I had a 486, but I didn't have a 3.5 inch drive, which I don't know why <laughs> the hell that was. So I would have to convert all the um, the uh, the 3.5 inch, which is 1.44 megabytes to the five and a quarters. God, now I feel old, um, uh, which is yeah. uh, 1.22 megabytes. So they wouldn't sit on there. So you would have to, um, wasn't RAR, it was like, you know, PK zip, but the, oh, okay. um, what, what was the one that, that split it up? It was like PK split, I think it was, because there was PK, PK zip, unzip, split, and then there was the repair one. I forget what God, that was called. You've got a PK better fix. memory than I do of, of <laughs> DOS command shell prompts and you know, tools like that. I do remember PK zip. I don't remember the split tool though. Yeah, those was, those was four. Those cool. um PK fix, PK zip, PK unzip, and then um PK split. And that, those were the four tools that you pretty much lived on. And then there's like stupid uh you know, old extensions no one uses anymore, like ARJ and like all these other ones that Oh yeah. <laughs> just like oh. how just like how uh you know three studio you'd have F L I and F L C which by yes. the way, it blows my mind that Today, you know, 25 years uh, later, because I just noticed mm -hmm. um, 25 years and six days ago, 3 Studio One came out. <laughs> yep. uh, I just read that the other day. It's not like I'm that much of a freak. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm still surprised that it still generates the um, 
I, IFL files. Like the, no the kidding. Yeah, yeah, the Mac still does IFLs. Absolutely. It is it's pretty remarkable that that's, that's still there. Yeah. It's a little um, bad habits, but anyway. <laughs> but yeah, so I started doing animation for the production company that I was working for. And, you know, the first thing that we did, we were doing at the time, we were working for Shell Oil because mm-hmm. obviously the oil industry down here in New Orleans is pretty big, but, or was at the time, they've all <laughs> Houston after yeah. the storm. Um, that, uh, you know, we were doing offshore oil safety training. And the guys were like, you know, the roughnecks who have to go out onto these oil platforms in the Gulf of Mexico, you know, they're usually taking helicopters or crew boats or things like that. And there are lots of accidents. It's dangerous. It's unbelievably dangerous, as it turns out. And they were like, you need to show in one of these tapes um, what not to do around the tail rotor of a helicopter when you get off. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) And so that was the first professional animation that got laid off. And of course, you know, again, this is also pre- being able to render out an AVI or a quick time movie, it was, you know, frame by frame. And then the controller at this point, I think it was the DiaQuest controller connecting to the three, to the beta SP deck that, you know, record a frame, stop pre run, pre, you know, pre roll it up, lay another frame, back it up. And it would take hours and hours and hours to get animation off. And of course it burned the heads up on those, those very expensive machines. But mm-hmm. at the time that's all we had. Until you got to the to the PVR and the 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 you know all of the 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 instant video recorders where you could actually lay the whole thing off in one shot. It had some sort of system to to lay it all off at once. Yep. But it's a- ancient technology by today's standards for sure. That's right. Uh, it's funny. I was just reading um, Robert Rodriguez's book he wrote back in ninety five. Mm-hmm. Yeah, ninety five. Uh, Rebel without a crew and. You know, it was it was a really amazing book. Like, um, I, I love when you pick up a book right at the time when you actually need it, and this is one of those. But you know, he's talking about his whole filmmaking process for El Mariachi, which was the first feature film he ever made, and the production yep. budget for that was seven thousand dollars, which is insane. Wow. Yeah, and but <laughs> just like listening to like or more reading his um, his whole production diary. Uh, while he's doing it all, it's just like it makes you really appreciate, you know, the tools that we have today for doing online, offline edits and everything oh. else, all the conforms. Yeah, things are so radically different than they were, you know, in the dark ages. Again, yeah. you know, between Chiron and white balance and getting all the level thing. I mean, you still have to do white balance, but I mean, mm-hmm. just the way that you had to set up your your edit suites and things like that. And who knows what kind of tapes were coming in, whether it was three quarter inch or VHS or beta or beta SP or yep. at the end, beta digital. Oh God, it was just, it was hard. It was, yep. it was not fun, but I mean, you know, at that same time period with 3d studio, that's when the Yoast group had, you know, with release two of DOS, they had started, throwing out the plugins. Mm -hmm. So they had their first batch and we started buying those. And I got very involved in the, in the plugins and using them for, for the work that we were doing all the, I forget what the iPads plugins, the IXP, PXPs, AXP and SXPs. Yoast Fire and Yoast Smoke, my two best friends and uh, (laughs) all the other ones. I'm just going to say, I remember uh, telling one of my buddies like, you know, I've got three studio three for DOS and like I can do a uh, twist of the movie now because like uh, I think Digimation uh, or one of those, which we'll get into later, but uh, yep. I think they released like a, a tornado plug in and it literally was just like a vortex particle system you had no control yep. over. But to me, I'm like, yeah, now I can make <laughs> twist of the movie. It's just like, you know, so I end up animating like, this shitty cow <laughs> spiraling around and I showed it to my friend after school one day and he's like, yeah, it's not the same. <laughs> no, not quite. The, yeah. the rendering level was a little bit different back then. Yeah, yeah. But I still had a cow, so I was proud. <laughs> but it was, but it was fun. I mean, I did lots of you know commercials and kind of motion graphics, early things for banks and for. I think we even did a treatment for Budweiser for a local spot they ran down here at one point, and mm-hmm. you know things like that. So it was a it was a great learning experience, for, if nothing else. I mean, you had to just sit down and immerse yourself. I don't think my wife, fortunately we didn't have any kids at that time. Right. I don't think she saw me for like the first month and a half of me learning 3d studio at that point, because I was at the office day and night, just absolutely hammering on the thing. So I knew, you know, all five modules inside and out and could, could get stuff done quickly because, you know, my boss's favorite saying was, Joe, oh, just get it done. <laughs> and it, that's the most annoying thing on the planet is just get it done. And then they start uh, giving you feedback after that. Yeah, well, of course, yeah, they yeah. don't. They don't want to give you the time, but I, so I guess things never change. But yeah, exactly. <laughs> for, for clients, but otherwise, I mean, you know, at, at some point, um, doing online editing and animation, there production work, I, I was given the the opportunity to go to work for Digimation. They needed somebody to for support. 
Mm -hmm. And I was the sixth employee and they had just moved out of the owner's house. They were working out of like a spare bedroom and they had just moved into like an official office. And uh, so I, I, I still know some companies 10 years later that are still in the house <laughs> and not the official office. Do you want to give just a quick background of like who Digimation is for anyone who's not, you know, they, well, they 30, started, 40? Right, exactly. Well, Digimation was kind of, they had started doing the original training tapes, the VHS tapes for 3D Studio DOS. They were the guys that literally recorded every single feature inside of 3D Studio. And, and it was, I guess, 20, 30 hours worth of video training. Um, if you could afford it, cause it was expensive. I think it was like 300 or 400 bucks. And of course my boss didn't want to pay for it, but I'd gotten to know him because they started to resell a few plugins as well. Um, and they also were a hardware reseller. So they were the ones we bought our, the PVR through, um, uh, ultimately. And that's how I got to know them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'd call and ask questions and we were doing, you know, animation work and I'd show it to them. And then, I got a little bit of contract work doing some accident reconstruction work for them, and they liked what they got. So they offered me the position to do technical support because they were just starting to build their own plugins. They had two of them when I joined, and they were, well, they actually had three. The third one wasn't out yet, but they had Bones and Lens Effects. So Bones Pro and Lens Effects were the two DOS plugins. Which were probably the two most impactful ones for 3D Studio at the time. I, I think it definitely changed the game. I mean, Bones was. Um, written by a guy who was working at Animatech, a Russian by the name of Mike Supno Sitnikov. Guys, mm -hmm. guys, guy just big brain, very smart, um, super nice guy. And um, I came in and within a couple of days was knew how the product worked. I had been able to talk to him a few times on the phone. Again, long before Skype and and uh, you know uh, voice messaging and VoIP and all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and had gone to a, a South by Southwest to demo for Autodesk. Wow. Um, and this was in the days where it was like card tables. And it wasn't very many people. But at that point, there were – I had done you know demos instantly of like snakes slithering around and all sorts of flowers animating and bending and things like that. And game companies were coming up to me. It was like literally two weeks I've just started. And they're like, if you want a job and you want to move to Texas here. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I, I just started with these guys. Stop. <laughs> Yeah, you know. I actually let me just jump. I'm sorry, I keep cutting you off all the time. No, no, but, no. Uh, but um, yeah, I, that's actually one piece of advice I've given to a lot of guys that have known, like guys and girls who've wanted to kind of find their path if they haven't really got one yet. Was always if if you know the package really well, like go be a demo artist because I've got so many friends at like let's say Autodesk who um, they've gone gone to that job and you end up knowing everyone in the industry and you'll have Weta and every other studio trying to poach you and. Even though they haven't even seen your work yet, and they're already trying to put you in position somewhere in their company. So, oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah. it is to me, it's one of the things just, just being part of the software development side and being kind of the kid in the candy store of being able to play with tools before anyone else got them. I mean, I got to meet guys like, you know, Tim Miller. My first experience with Tim, who I love, um, his, his first phone call to Digimation for me to support him was this motherfucking piece of software sucks. What the fuck's the matter with it? And of course, if, if yeah. you know Tim, obviously, you know, that's, he's just, he's passionate. He loves 3D. He hates when things don't work. There was some weird network rendering problem with Bones Pro. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as somebody who's doing technical support, you have to have the mentality of, okay, somebody's angry and it's my job to make them happy. Yep. <laughs> you know, you can't just be like, take it personal. Like the guy's mad at me. It's like, I had no idea who Tim was at the time. Yep. I didn't know who Blur was. I just knew I had a customer on the phone. And I think we spent two weeks going back and forth and I had Mike writing custom versions for Tim to try out. And ultimately I think we got it solved. And Tim's been one of those guys I can count on. He's like, look, if you guys ever need stuff for your demo reel, Blur will take care of you. I was like, That's cool. Oh, awesome. That's great. So him and Dave Stinnett and, mm -hmm. you know, at the time, uh, Aaron Powell and Eli Arabian over at Westwood. Jeez. Those guys were big. John yep. Burnett over at Blizzard. Well, it's funny. I was just writing down, like, uh, sorry again, cutting off, but no, like, no. Um, but yeah, just talking about this stuff, I started writing down, like, I got to track down some people from Westwood and <laughs> other places because I'm going down memory lane here. But oh, it's, yeah. it's kind of funny with Dave and, and Tim because, like, they're polar opposites, you know? It's like, um, <laughs> and the thing yes. about, about Tim, too, is it's not like if he's swearing, it doesn't necessarily mean he's pissed. He's just passionate. Well, that's but, what he does. I mean, he just did it, I think, a couple of weeks ago at uh, Adobe Max. Oh, yeah? It, just as he was on the main stage with the Adobe folks and he started swearing and he was just, yeah, I'm just kind of a goof, whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, just don't pay no attention to me. <laughs> you know, so it, it was good. But I mean, that's, it is absolutely where I got to know everybody. And then 
working for, and just like working for Autodesk, working for the plugin vendor, we were going to GDC and to SIGGRAPH and Autodesk University and to IBC and all over the place. And you're demoing for these just massive crowds. And so you get to meet pretty much anyone and everyone. At the time, LucasArts was big. So it was Ron Lucier and mm-hmm. Gary Gaber, who I've kept in touch with. He's got his own little place in Austin. So these things tend to come back around. The 3D community is really small. Yeah. And so Especially you, back you then. tend to... Right, exactly. But you just get to know all of these individuals and you just track them over their careers, which is fun. I mean, I've seen just with Autodesk, I don't know, six or seven different product managers come and go. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, it's think guys like Bob Bennett, who was there originally way back in the DOS days, who's now over at Toon Boom. You have Phil Miller, who Frank, followed him. Frank Delise and Frank, and yeah. then Dan Prohaska, Shane, Eddie, Madeline Jean. I mean, all these people have just kind of cycled in and out um, mm-hmm. of the of the job but you keep track of them and they if you know if you get along with them then there are opportunities in the future as well yeah so that's been that's been really helpful too but yeah it's you know there's it's such a good community too especially on the on the autodesk side that was we picked wisely mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> no, that's good and like you know I, I love that like i love that you know this community is so big and it, it keeps growing and there's people that you you meet 20 years ago or whatever. And, um, you know, later on you end up like bumping into, into each other at SIGGRAPH or whatever. And it's like, holy shit. Like, you know, um, actually talking about Westwood, I remember one morning I was at SIGGRAPH, um, I was speaking, we're at the Western Point Adventure in LA and mm-hmm. yeah, I was having breakfast and like the bunch of guys came over there like, Hey, you know, do you mind if we sit with you and have breakfast? And I'm like, uh, sure. You know, why not? And <laughs> one, you know, a bunch of random strangers didn't really care. You know, I'm hungover. But then one of the guys is chatting and then he mentions like, oh yeah, like on Command and Conquer and Red Alert, we're doing the cinematics. And I'm like, holy shit, like <laughs> now, now I'm listening, like, you know, you guys are even, you know, more old school. That's the kind of shit that got me like into 3D. So, um, well, we played, we played it religiously in our office too. I mean, it was one of those things that you'd find little cheats where suddenly you'd overpower, you know, uh, you know, uh, upgrade all of your guys immediately where mm-hmm. your opponents wouldn't have it and you just destroy them and they're like hey what's going on <laughs> so well, is there anything you could do to win the, the first email I ever sent was actually to westwood studios to um to their tech support i was like 14 or something and i'm like can i <laughs> can i get the 3d files <laughs> and they, they replied back and said like oh you know like we don't have access to that and you know due to copyright we probably can't but we would if we could you know so i thought it's kind of cool <laughs> but yeah well, at I, least they responded i mean yeah. now it's half the companies are just like yeah forget it just yeah. don't don't even bother yeah and that's and and that's a kind of the bad thing about the internet is you get the mob mentality and you get this kind of complete disregard for Mm -hmm. for the people who are involved and so you know we get questions from high school kids all the time and you know we personally to me i mean 3d matters it just does on a very kind of fundamental level and so i'm always i do career days around the city um i'm you know helping the lsu uh, advisory board for for Mark Obinell's kind of master's program. I'm dealing with the AIE guys who started down in Australia. They're that school. Yeah, actually, a, l- a lot of companies come from Australia. It blows my mind. Um, you know, a lot of discrete. You know, like Flame obviously came from yeah. down there. Uh, Digital Fusion parts of it, Black Magic. Um, but yeah, even you know, uh, yeah, a, a lot of that shit kind of comes from uh, down that way, which is pretty awesome. Right, and so we see artists that throw stuff up on Turbo Squid now. And it's, it's not up to snuff and mm-hmm. you know, there's checkmate and we can talk about that later too, if you like. But sure. the whole idea is, is that you hate to, because the models come down at that point, our support department is now starting to pull these things down, but I never like to have them just do it where the guy's like, what happened? Mm-hmm. So we always reach out and we tell them and we'll give them guides. And it's like, Hey man, if you want to hear all these great things you can watch and resources and here's the standard and we want to help you if you want to be part of the community be a part of that community. That's important. You know, if you're, if you're passionate about it, you'll find a way to make it happen. So, um, it's one of those things that we take real pride in and, you know, I'm on our forums with our artists, giving them feedback. And a lot of times, you know, it's nitpicks. It's things like, Oh, you, you, your clay renders don't look, there's not enough contrast there. And it's hard for me to read. And they will be like, yeah, I guess, I guess you're right. Let's, let's rework those or whatever. It's just pushing people kind of out of their comfort zone a little bit. Yeah. So uh, that's really cool. Um, yeah, I mean, I love it. I love, um, you know, the whole community and how it's kind of built. And like even, um, you know, 
the Maya community too. You, get, you know, after a while, it all kind of merges together. And at least these days, we, we don't really have the software battles that used to kind of exist back then. Oh, no. The only software battles we have at this point are just trying to keep current. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Stay on top of it. I mean, these things evolve so fast. It's it's hard. I, I, you know, I hate to sound like the curmudgeon, the old guy now. It's like, God, I just wish it would stay the way it is for a whole while. <laughs> Just yep. doesn't, you know. I'm still on Windows Seven, and I keep getting that stupid Windows Ten pop up. I'm like, ah, I'm just not going there. I, I finally did. A, you were just talking about this before, but like, um, I just got a new machine, and um, actually, because I did an interview with Alf Lavold, who did the, uh, I, I can never say the name of it. It's um, basically did a short film about zombies and giant killer plants and everything else. Oh, I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I'm having drinks with him tonight. He's in L.A. Uh, this week, so we've already had dinner, but we're. Uh, I think Andrew Kramer hopefully is going to come out. Uh, Alf is coming out. A bunch of other guys, a few guys from DD. So it should be a good good mashup. But um, yeah, he did the whole thing on one machine using just Tide Next cards. So I ended up that kind of inspired me to Damn. you know to beef up and spend like ten grand and buy like a super box. And um, yeah, so <laughs> I, I switched to Windows ten and uh, yeah, I like it. Like Win- <laughs> I never did Windows eight. eight? Yeah. Oh I, God. I, no. Yeah, that, that thing pissed me off. Just I couldn't even use it, which says something. Oh, it's, it's the most absurd thing, but we couldn't, we had to, it's funny is that we we ended up going to E3 this year for the first time in forever because we did the deal with Ford Motor Company and they were doing stuff with Microsoft for Forza. And so we had to present in their booth and we were like, yeah, it'd be really bad for us to bring our iPads into the Microsoft booth. So we're going to have to go get some Surface tablets so that we can <laughs> show all this stuff off. Windows 8 on the Surface tablet still is awful. I just could not – it just hurt my soul. <laughs> Every time I had to be like, okay, how do I dismiss this? It's like swipe and swipe back and do – oh, my God. I was just like, this is so unintuitive. Who thought this was a good idea? Yeah. So, yeah, that's why I've held off from Windows 10. I mean, I've heard it's it's pretty reasonable, especially compared to Windows 8, but – I'm yep. gonna hold out until the very last minute. Sorry, that's my dog's that's obviously totally, barking at something. That's totally fine. <laughs> hey, at least it's not Vista. But uh, so true. so I mean, you know, making the transition. Uh, actually, one thing I just want to touch base on before we get further in is you're mentioning you came out to LA and you're you're saying you know it's like people would rather be rather see you be hit by a bus than to see you yeah. succeed and like that kind of mentality. So like you're you're saying that you know a lot of people obviously are kind of more you know fending for themselves and out to see themselves succeed. So no one's really going to jump in and help you kind of, you know, move forward. Is that kind of what you experienced? Or? Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was really kind of interesting because at the time, I think what finally was the straw that broke the camel's back for me was there was, there was a specific movie I was working on um, with Pam Gidley and Tom Sizemore. And he was, you know, he'd just finished lock up super nice guy. And, and, um, I I was basically, you know, a set PA at that point and a camera assistant. So those Mm -hmm. were the two things I was doing. I was film loading and stuff like that. Not a whole lot of money in it. Um, It's kind of like lunch money more than anything else. It's it's more you got to pay your dues. Absolutely. And I didn't mind doing that. I was young. I was happy to be out there. It was fun. It was, I had friends on the set and I enjoyed that. Um, But at some point they said, oh, you know, we're going to, we're going to have this kind of car chase and we need to have some storyboards done. And I went, storyboards? Well, I can draw because, you know, that was when I came out of college with – I wasn't a, a, a fine arts degree, but that was part of my major anyway. So I had good good 2D drawing skills. I was like, I can do that. And they said, really? I said, sure. I said, all I need to know is what, what aspect ratio we're shooting so that we can – so I can go get the storyboard paper. And they were like, great. Just go ask the DP, the mm-hmm. production manager. And I can't remember her name. But she sent me over to talk to the DP. And I asked him, and he couldn't have been nicer. He said, oh, we're shooting 1185. It's great. I think they were doing some storyboards. And he said, okay, great. Left that day, went and got the storyboard paper, came to the director's house, which is where a friend of mine was actually editing the movie mm-hmm. um, in, her, in her house, in her spare bedroom. Everyone's in their own bedrooms. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I opened the front door, and she is immediately in my face like, what the f- fuck did you do? And I'm like, what are you talking about? My DP has walked off the set and it's your fault. What the hell did you say? And I was like, what are you talking about? I have no idea what's going on here. I said, the production manager asked me to talk to the DP about what aspect we're shooting so that we can do the storyboards for the car chase. Who gave you the right to do that? I'm like the production manager. (laughs) 
And at that point, you know, she's like, you better get him back or otherwise it's, you know, it's going to be your ass. And I'm like, okay, fine. So I'm spending, you know, calling, calling, calling this guy. Of course, he's not answering his phone. Right. I'm leaving message after message, basically apologizing for no reason going, dude, if I offended you, I'm really, really sorry. I, I had no idea that this was very you know sensitive or you felt like you were being undermined or anything like that. Um, and I, and I did not mean to overstep my bounds. I thought that I was doing everybody a favor and it, if it backfired, then, I'm, you know, I'll take, right. I'll fall on my sword. And the guy finally called me back and he's like, Bo, this was never your fault. <laughs> don't, don't even worry about it. You're, we're cool. Don't, don't sweat it. It's the production manager I'm mad at because she didn't bother to tell either the director or me first. And so that's where I got really pissed off and the director kind of agreed with her. And so there was this this clash of egos there. And I was just like, Oh God. <laughs> and then I go back into the production offices and the production manager is like, well, I think you owe me an apology. And I was like, I, for what, you know? And it yeah. was just, it was, it just became instantly unpleasant and awkward. And you know, the storyboards never did happen. Right. You know? So I was out the, my lunch money on storyboard paper that I probably have in my attic somewhere still. Oh, <laughs> as there a you go. E- eBay that shit. <laughs> or hanging <laughs> on your wall. You're right. Like, right. So, um, and at that point that was really kind of the end of it, but I mean, mm-hmm. I'd had some fun out there, but yeah, it was, and it was a different time where everyone wanted to be, you know, they're, they're all trying to make their bones. They're all trying to, to one up one another and, and be the smartest guy in the room or the smartest woman in the room. And they were just too busy with that. And this kind of goofy politics, you know, the goofy politics rather than collaborating and making something fun. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. in fact, I don't even think the movie came out. <laughs> that so, says something, but yeah. I guess, I guess lesson learned with the, with the DP, I guess like, uh, his qualm, you know, obviously is more cause he wanted to be in charge of framing and figuring out the shots and not, having it delegate to someone else. Is well, that I think, what you, I think your it, take was? I think it was more the fact that he was even, he wasn't even aware that anyone had thought of doing storyboards. Right. Which meant, which to him being a 20 something as well, he interpreted to mean they don't have faith in my ability to compose these shots and come up with the visual sequence. Yep. Yep. And so it, it was just, just bizarre. <laughs> so, yep. <laughs> Sounds like it, but you know, lesson learned, I guess. So, uh, yeah. You know, I, I can say that I worked in the film industry for a little while and, you know, I, I survived. It's I, just, you know, yeah. moving out to L.A., my wife was not happy about that either. And it was just mm-hmm. like, okay, well, she had roots here in the area. So we, we ended up staying here and I'm very happy. That's good. That's good. Yeah. And, you know, I, I guess like there are such, um, especially in Hollywood, like such massive politics. And like, I do think that as you, you go on, like the more experience you get, the more you can you can kind of see the bullshit kind of stemming and you can you know so you can either avoid it or at least see it as a warning sign like you know that this is the kind of um yeah in- environment and, that you're, you're gonna be walking into and i think that comes with age too a little bit yeah. a little bit of that wisdom in terms of you don't have to take things so seriously i mean you know as an artist you're responsible for doing something and it's one of those things that you know i try and tell the, the college kids that i talk to as well is it's like it's not like college where it's like, I'll just kind of do something and pass it off as finished. It's like, when you're on dead, deadline, you've got to deliver. So that means if you're getting 30 minutes of sleep for the next you know, two weeks to make sure that this thing happens, it has to happen. The People are counting on you, and if you love it, you're going to end up doing it. So um, That's good. Yeah. I mean, it's it, it's taking that kind of responsibility, but at the same time, it's the idea of, don't fight. Don't don't cause work and problems where none exist. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's where you have. If you have a great team, they're going to support you at some level. I, I mean, I'm sure you're in your experience in you know in high end visual effects that that has happened to. I mean, I know that Blur runs those guys crazy. Um, you know, with with long hours, and I have you know guys like Brandon, who who I've known forever since he was in Dallas. Uh, and I think he's now up in San Francisco and telecommuting and things like that. It's like they mm-hmm. they work them hard, but they they have fun together. I mean, it's a yeah. good it's a good place to be, and that that makes a difference. If it's an uncomfortable position at that point, it's like you yeah, know, why would you bother? I, I, I think that you know there's there's the type of environments where people work hard, and but the thing is that it's because you're all passionate, you're all driven, and um, then there's places that 
like even the more worst case scenario is you're you're working hard for no reason. You know, it's either yeah. uh, because people need to validate their jobs, so they make all the artists work crazy, so it feels like they're they're doing that, or they're just making poor decisions or poor planning. So you've got to go and you know redo everything several times. You know, and but you know yeah. the the good thing is that they, you do find those places like Blur and other other ones that um, you know people love what they do and they they want to put in the extra time because. Um, one philosophy that it's only really kind of been the last couple of years that I've really started to finally adopt is that, you know, once this is done, like you're not ever going to be able to go back and, and tweak it. So, uh, you know, make it the best yep. it can be. Absolutely right. Yeah. It's, this is not a project that you can just noodle forever. You yeah. know, the passion projects where you get to work on it until, you know, the cows come home. You've got exactly. to, got to turn it over. That's so, good, man. Yeah. And so when you went to Digimation, um, uh-huh. you know, obviously they became pretty damn big because at one point, yeah. you know, before Turbo Squid kind of took over the, um, you know, coincidentally the same time that you went to Turbo Squid. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, at one point they were kind of the big publisher for, I guess, publisher, right? For, yeah, oh, absolutely. For I plugins mean, I, and everything else. Oh, without question. I worked with, in the DOS side, you know, we, we had the two or three plugins. It was Bones and then Lens Effects. And I think Mirage and Fractal oh. Flow came out. God. Yeah. A couple of those. Fractal Flow was the one for Max, right? It was Mirage, but for Max, right? Um, correct. I think yeah. there was a Fractal Flow for DOS too, but again. Okay. I thought there's, Mirage there's, was that. Yeah, I think they're all pretty much the same at that point. Just doing all the, the post-processing. Um, yeah, just doing you know, like uh, and pixel displacement. And, yeah, exactly. all that good stuff. Yeah. And then we started to have the companies that were doing Bones. So Bones came out of Animatech and Animatech had done World Builder and they had a whole bunch of very big brain Russian programmers who were doing all sorts of things. This is where, uh, I don't know if Oleg actually worked there, Oleg Beberodin, who did Sandblaster and Particle Studio and then yeah. Particle Flow and all the other stuff. But Joe Antonov, who did, you know, they, Autodesk said, yeah, you can never get a, a DOS plugin to work inside of Max. Mm-hmm. And he was like, yeah, I don't agree. And he went and he figured out how to write a wrapper. Now it wasn't terribly efficient, but he proved that people weren't thinking. So yeah, that so video posts over. kind of stuff, right? Right, exactly. Mm-hmm. But he, you know, there were lots of plugins that started coming out from those guys. And then that started to attract other developers and other publishers or uh, just other um, developers who wanted their tools out there. And we were writing the manual so from my perspective, again, it was great that I became the de facto product manager because I knew 3D Studio inside and out. I was helping write most of the documentation, so I was working with the developer very closely. And I was also helping kind of guide them in terms of user interface. Because it's like, as an artist, there were certain tools when you first got them, you're like, I don't get this. I, I just don't understand what, what you're trying to achieve here. And the button that you're supposed to click is like three panels away, but it's the first thing that you're supposed to. It was just, there's some, you know, very poor UI design, but that, you know, it is what it is. Yeah. And we'd get these tools so that they worked and a lot of them won awards. And as the 3D Studio Max release started to come around at the time, Bob Bennett, who is the product manager, kind of looped us in and of course talk about floppy disk because then you had I forget what was it 21 22 floppy disk just for Windows NT right. just to get that to work and God was that a you know a painful thing I, to get I think that I've, I've erased that from my memory so that's a good thing I guess <laughs> right for Jaguar I think was the first one oh, yeah. uh, for I the remember. first iteration of Max right and you know we it was for I was fortunate again in that I was at the right place at the right time we got to fly out to San Rafael when they were beta testing Max, and I got to be taught by the OS group. Cool. So Jack Powell Gary, and, and Gary and Tom and Dan Silva and Gus and all those guys were there. And, you know, they're asking us, there's three full days, and you're in the San Rafael offices of Autodesk, and you're like, oh, my God, this is <laughs> wild. And you got dogs walking around, and people are like, hey, the beer bust is in 30 minutes. We're going to go <laughs> get loaded. It's Friday. It's like, great. This is wonderful. Yeah. Uh, but having them kind of go, what do you like? What do you don't like? And I think to all, to a man of like the eight or 12 of us that were there in that first session, we all were like, man, we love the interactivity because in 3D Studio DOS, you couldn't do half the stuff you could, just the feedback of particles. You want a keyframe, you got to jump in hit F4 and go to the keyframe. Oh, God. And actually, I'm just going to say quickly, like how many times have you accidentally been in the 3D editor and you're moving shit around thinking that you're in the <laughs> keyframe? Then you're like, fuck. Oh, yes. Oh, all the time. <laughs> 
Yeah. And you just start to look at that menu on that right hand nav, and you're like, okay, I'm in the right spot now. Yes. Okay. <laughs> now I'll go ahead and touch something. Yep. Yep. Um, but we all we all love the interactivity. And I think to a man, most of us hated the uh, the material editor mm-hmm. as we were so used to the DOS material editor, where things were all kind of all in one instead of having to drill up and down into materials and maps and whatnot. It, it was just hard for us at the time. Now it's yep. like so simple it's like what were we thinking this is just this is wonderful i still use max's traditional one i haven't moved over to the slate editor so i'm, I'm still I, I, yeah. I do too i use a compact material editor most yep. of the time for me the the problem with the slate that uh, you know gets me every time is the double click to activate something so right. i'll have two or three materials that are the exact same base material and i'll be editing the wrong one mm-hmm. and i'm like god damn it now i gotta start <laughs> up so that's that's one of those kind of nagging sore, sore points with me. But sounds but, like you go back to San Rafael. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, now it's uh, actually just downtown in San Fran. But, yep, yep. But we had I think fifty or sixty plugins towards the end, and we you know for Max, we God man, I, I can't tell how many different developers that we worked with. Um, you know, it's um, you know Harry Denholm and Matt Kausten and. and Diego Castano, who had did Mancua, and mm-hmm. the guys at Blur, Stephen Scott, when they were there, and yep. JJ Hasing, and Dave Gould, and Mark Snoswell, and oh god, what, man, what did Dave Fredso. Gould uh, develop? I, I can't yeah, Illustrate. Remember Illustrate. Illustrate. He That's did right. the Tootie stuff, and then yeah, there were the 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 uh, atmospheric wars between Afterburn and Pyrocluster and <laughs> um, Ultrashock. We had there was the third one that Nick Foscarini oh, did. I, I can't so. I can't remember. Uh, I, I I remember I like Ultrashock. I just can't remember what the hell uh, it looked like anymore. It's been so long. It was, yeah, I helped design that interface with with Nick directly. So that was one of those fun ones. And then Ivan and Stas who did hair. Mm-hmm. You know, hair and fur, the original stuff where they were like, yeah, we're using a cracked copy of, of 3D Studio Max to get this first <laughs> thing done. And we're like, oh, we'll get you squared away. And we got them a legitimate copy to develop on. Well, uh, to get the, things. That was the biggest uh, issue I had with, um, like, I, I used to work at mainly Maya Studios, like my whole, pretty much my first half of my career. But I, I'd be the, um, the, the kid in the corner, you know, doing 90% of the visual effects for the studio all in like 3D Studio 3 or whatever, while everyone else is in like Maya 5, you know, and, yep. and um, you know, I would have to beg and plead. To, I, actually, we never even upgraded to 4, but like, th- that that was the thing. I was using this old piece of crap thing, and you look at the studio I was at, um, their entire reel was pretty much all like Afterburn and, and shit like that coming out of Max, and um, oh, yeah. what was my point of all this was, uh, I've, I've actually lost track now, but <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to bitch and whine about that. Um <laughs> But no, actually, it was to do with with Afterburn. So like Kresmir, I always kept telling him, like we gotta we gotta make a, a version for Maya because this would kill. Because this was like let's say two thousand one, there was nothing around. Random Man had some good Raymarsh shaders. Uh, Digital Nature Tools sucked really bad. Yep. Uh, right and then, yeah. even when uh, Maya Fluids came out, like it wasn't really a, a a solution for doing particle stuff. Like you could attach containers to particles, but it wasn't the same thing. And I was telling him, like, you will make millions because there's a much bigger industry, especially for film, for doing, like, very much of stuff and there's no good solutions. But, um, yeah, the main reason was he's like, I don't have, like, I don't own Maya, so I'm not going to develop for it. Um, so like, if he if he got a free copy of it, he would gladly go and develop it, uh, for it. But uh, so that was the one thing holding him back. And I felt like telling him, like, just go crack it and start developing this, <laughs> you know. Yeah, it's it's interesting because you, I mean, when you're talking about the film industry, you're talking about the kind of the tip, the public tip of that pyramid yep. of, of 3D users, too. I mean, it's very, very popular, very visible. I, you know, I'm curious to know how many, you know, active seats there were at that time, too. Yeah, absolutely. Because it was still really expensive. I mean, it was still alias. It was still... I think in the five figure range somewhere. And then it had come down to like the 79, 95 or somewhere in that space. I think that was the weird thing is that these products all came kind of crashing down yep. um, all at once. I know that once Microsoft had, had purchased soft homage and had ported it over to, to windows, to NT. windows yeah. right? Exactly. We were up in Redmond as a matter of fact, cause it wanted us to write plugins for soft homage. And we're like, but there's no users on NT. You just bought it. Yeah. It's not even out yet. So it was a, but it was fun trip up to 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 Redmond yeah, and seeing cool. the Microsoft campus. But and you know I got to meet guys that ended up moving over to, to Autodesk at some point in their careers anyway. So, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, I think that the developers had 
it's it's almost a Sophie's choice in terms of you know Max has got so many users and and at that time especially I mean between Max four and Max eight Max nine Max nine was really kind of the first pain point where you went thirty two sixty four bit so you had to develop twice and right. test twice and developers really didn't like that for a while yeah. that was painful myself included um, but that was really just this amazing time where you had every tool known to man. I mean, if you go on to maxplugins.de or any of these things, <laughs> man, you see Peter Wagey's name like freaking everywhere for every version of Max and every possible kind of plugin that you could think of. He wrote something. He was a huge, like one of the biggest contributions to 3D Studio Max was, was Peter. Right. Yeah, and he had done Surface Tools, mm -hmm. which was a little $95 tool that Digimation had sold, and we got to know Peter very well, and the thing sold like wildfire. It was the patch surfacing yeah. technology one that of, he had. One of the uh, lead modeling supervisors at ILM, uh, Giovanni Napco. Uh, oh, yeah. Like, yeah, he he was, like, all of us kind of grew up together, and, like, Geo was doing such um, amazing work just uh, using Surface Tools. Like, he would create yep. his um, low-res um, you know, mesh cage based on just like, you know, building all the splines and he'd surface it and then he'd start like doing all the, the poly work on top of that and then using mesh smooth on, on that. And that became like the base of like a lot of the work that, you know, I guess oh. like he was doing, even when he went to um, ILM, he's still, you know, on the side doing that and then doing it all in carry, um, you know, when he was nice. there as well. Yeah, really he does cool. amazing stuff. As a matter of fact, for some reason, I think the Digimation interviewed him Oh, yeah? At one point to come in for technical support, and it, that was not a not a good fit. Right. <laughs> and he he rightfully turned that down and <laughs> moved along. <laughs> so well, I was gonna say uh, you mentioned David Gould before. Um, I was just talking with um, I, I've done an episode that's coming out soon with Next Limit about mm -hmm. Rillflow, and it's oh, funny because yeah. I remember during Lord of the Rings, I uh, I was helping, I was talking a lot with Next Limit about um, you know a lot of issues they were having with trying to get like multi-sim, like back then they, they hadn't figured it out yet, but trying to get multi-simulations happening on over multiple machines and trying yep. to help out like being technical support for Weta for like Return of the King doing a lot of lava. And then I was going to, actually it was, you're right, Digimation, because I went to the Digimation lunch uh, in San Diego. It was my first Seagraph in 03. And um, David Gould ended up like pairing up with me and, and Martin Coven as well. And like we were chatting away and I so remember like, that lunch. Yeah. Yeah. So that was, yeah, I totally forgot about that. And um, so I, th I think I still have a photo somewhere of it. I, um, but, but yeah, like I, I remember end up, end up talking to David Gould about it on his end. So, you know, talking with Next Limit uh, about how they can get all their shit going and then talking with David on the weather end about like how to, you know, go about getting all the lava shit done. And it was just like this big kind of dilemma that I was going through. But, um, but yeah, it's kind of fascinating. Like, I don't know. I, I guess I guess it's very easy to go pretty nostalgic on this stuff. Well, I mean, it's it's the same people again. It's a small community. It's like once you once you kind of put yourself out there and are part of the community, it, it tends to you tend to find those same people at at one position or another. I mean, people have moved in and out of production. Um, again, I, between the the Autodesk and the Blur guys, I mean, they've they've kind of seeded so many other different companies over the years. At that point, that yeah. You know, if if you don't know who they are, then you, they're more than happy to to get to know you here in the future too. So I mean, mm -hmm. you know, it is it is a fairly small fraternity, and I don't mean to say that in terms of it's a guys' club only. It's no. definitely you know you got folks like Kelsey at Autodesk who is who is a kickass you know artist mm -hmm. um, as well, and is now doing product design and things like that for them. But I mean, it, it's it's fun. It, it it's a good it brings back lots of good memories too. I yep. mean that's the thing is it's always fun to kind of sit back and go oh yeah I remember all that when I was young and <laughs> still had a healthy <laughs> liver and all that stuff. Especially living in New Orleans. Uh, Very so, true. So um, what was it like when you know basically Digimation was you know doing really well and um, yep. you know, obviously had a huge corner of the market. You left at uh, a certain point went to Turbo Squid and like what was it like? Once you had moved over to Turbo Squid and where they were at at that point in time, and you know, right, what, I guess it, what your journey was from that point onward. Sure. As a matter of fact, I mean, it was uh, Turbo Squid was being formed behind the scenes. It, Tur Digimation was there at the same time, and so it, it would happen to be guys that I had grown up with, Matt and Andy Wisdom. 
Um, and it just so happened that we had a contractor at Digimation who was doing work for Matt and Andy's company, Chimera Digital Imaging. They were doing kind of high-end um, commercial work. They had spent the money on the you know the the SGI Indigo and a, a cut of of uh, Power Animator and things like that. And they were doing all sorts of stuff for Freeport, Mac Moran and and other companies in the city doing animation work and, and online editing. They had, I think, a Flint or a Flame mm-hmm. uh, edit bay as well. And um, it just so happened that this one guy seemed to communicate back and forth, and and suddenly we we started talking, and it was like they had kind of the same idea that for what Turbo Squid could be is that we did. And um, we decided to kind of pool resources and do things like that. You know, there's – there's lots of kind of dirty laundry that happened kind of in that whole time frame as well. That that, that's why I, will, I, that's I, why I kind of sk- skipped over hamper. that. <laughs> yeah, I'll, gla- I'll gladly leave that in the hamper. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, so what was it like when you got to Terra Square? Yeah, yeah, I mean, once that was because I was asked to leave um, in 2001, late 2000 or early 2002. Mm-hmm. And um, immediately after I was let go, I let Autodesk know um, because I was dealing with them, you know, every day, all day. You're you're the face to, right. to an extent. And yeah. So I had to let them know that that was the case, and I reached out to all the developers um, at that point and was like, "Look, I, I can still help beta test. I can help write documents. I can help push the tools and do whatever you need me to do." So I stayed involved because it wasn't for about another nine months before I actually started at Turbo Squid. And I had talked to Matt and Andy uh, several times and they wanted to bring me on. And we had always had this plan of doing kind of this set of certified plugins, stuff that would work together. Mm-hmm. And um, we met at SIGGRAPH in San Antonio that summer and sat down with Autodesk and with Ken Pimentel and with um, Mike Lee, who was, who was working there at that point. And and went through the process of what we wanted to do. And it, it, the initial idea was is that the plugins would end up being Autodesk plugins, that it, they would have Autodesk branding on them. And right. at the 11th hour, they decided well, we can't really do that because the way that their sales mechanism was set up internally was that it, it just didn't mesh. I mean, it's you're talking about enormous company. There's a lot of overhead. There's a lot of pre-planning. And it just it wasn't nimble enough to to handle what we were trying to do Mm -hmm. and that's fine. And so they said, just rebrand them as discrete certified plugins because they just bought discrete logic. So we started with, uh, five tools. Um, final tune, I think was the first thing that came out from Edwin from Cebus. And, uh, I had actually helped beta test that during my time off between Digimation and Turbo Squid and had helped develop that a little, develop it. I helped test it and provide feedback. Um, for Edwin's team, and it was a cool piece of technology. Mm-hmm. And then we had Human IK that had come up from Kdara, and um, Afterburn, and Dreamscape, and Final Render Stage One. And you know, part of what I was tasked with doing that Autodesk had mandated was you have to make sure that the source code is escrowed, and you have to make sure that the um, plugins actually work together. Mm-hmm. And of course, that's no small feat. <laughs> with yeah. with different technologies. I mean, especially when you had developers like Edwin and Crezo. And, <laughs> and I'm, look, I, and, I, and I don't, again, I don't say that to be sorry to be crass or to, 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 to dump on either one of these guys. They're both friends of mine at this point. Yep. I, I think highly of both of them. They're incredibly smart. You know, I, for, for that alone, that it is, it is a testament to their willingness to follow me a little bit. Mm-hmm. that those tools actually worked together really well. Afterburn rendered with Final Render unbelievably well before anybody else. I mean, it was doing things that we couldn't do otherwise. Yeah, but that's because it's a ray to... trace renderer. It wasn't like um, because they specifically made them play nicely together. Oh, oh no, they we had, <laughs> we had to put custom code in to make it work. I mean, it oh, was really? one of those. Oh, yeah, there was... They were incompatible at some level early on, and we added features, and we had to make sure that one didn't crash the other, destabilize it, and... You, I mean, Edwin and, and Crezo. Edwin didn't intentionally crash the other. <laughs> well, I, I won't go there. No, I'm just kidding. It was, it was, um, it, it's, those guys worked very hard and mm-hmm. it was a, a very interesting time. And it was one of my proudest moments to say that I was able to get those guys to, 
to put aside competitive differences and they still remain competitors and, mm-hmm. you know, but there was a respect there that was, um, hard earned. And hopefully I think that it's made both of them, um, uh, you know, I think a little, I think age has certainly mellowed them a little bit as yeah. well. But, um, it's, it's, I'll just, I'll just jump in and say like, it's, it's definitely one of those mentality things. Cause I've, you know, obviously it sounds like you've gone to like great extents to try and, um, get the, that all happening. And, but like, you know, I've, I've had many, many conversations on both ends where it's like, if you get your tool to work with everyone else's, then it's cross compatible. It means that people are going to use your tool. Whereas there are so many times where, uh, we're looking at purchasing, you know, in, in some of some of it for an uh, entire studio, um, you know, several packages, several, everything like tens of thousands of dollars of software. And then it's like, well, we want to get this, but it doesn't work with this other tool. So we're going to have to go with the other option that does. Yep. And that's actually the more favorable thing. So, well, the know. sum is always greater than the, the individual parts in this, in those kinds of things, especially for a tool like max, which is the yep. Swiss army knife. Everyone calls it that, which does rely on, on all these different plugin technologies to really kind of build a custom toolbox, this larger than, you know, a base package should have. And you just had to, fight through things. And I mean, we were adding plugins, you know, particle flow tools, box one and box three. And then there was thinking particles two came on and all these different kind of technologies and trying to keep them all coordinated was, Mm -hmm. was a pretty tall order. And then making sure they got released, they all had the same authorization system because they wanted Autodesk wanted consistency. So they all had, we had to write up a protection scheme that they could all implement into their own tools and that it would connect to our servers so that people could get authorized 24 seven. And I mean, it was, it was a fun time. I have to admit. I mean, and then you had Autodesk salespeople out pushing the plugins. So right. again, that's how the Gary Davis and the Louis Marcou and the Vince and, you know, uh, Chris Murray and all those guys at the time, and Adam and whomever else, I, I'm sure I'm forgetting lots of people, which is mm-hmm. just I'll chalk up to being old. Oh, I'll um, say it's too many. <laughs> <laughs> is that, you know, they were out there able to show, hey, look, we can compete with anybody because you've got all these really cool tools that can do a hell of a lot on top of what just the base package can do. And mm. it's extensible and there's ways to, to you know, to, to tailor your solution for your needs. If you're doing... You know, like ANSI and, and you. I mean, you guys, you're using Krakatoa, you're using Fume, you used Afterburn, you used, you know, all of TP2. It's like all of those tools just, they become part of your kit. And that's part of your arsenal. Whereas, you know, a design guy may not need that, but he may need Roof Designer and Final Render and Tune and, mm-hmm. you know, this other stuff. And it allows that kind of flexibility. So, um, that's cool. You know, that's, yeah. Yeah. And I guess, um, we're like obviously over the years it's kind of changed you know the, your direction or i should say turbosquiz direction has obviously kind of uh, shifted and changed and like i guess a lot of people in the past would always kind of be familiar with turbosquid for your model bank and yep. like you know i'm just kind of curious like what was your experience with with that both in the early days and you know how it is now well the early days it was very much the wild west and we were you know, it's it's I, like 3D Cafe where it's just like thousands of models upon thousands right, of models. Right, exactly. Yeah. yeah, when I came on in 2002, it was just over two years old. I mean, I've been there at TurboSquid now for 13, a little over 13 years. So the, the industry's evolved. The, the site has evolved too. But it was very much the Wild West in that we were trying to be the Southwest Airlines to, at the time, Viewpoint Data Labs mm-hmm. um, in Utah. Wow. Had, it's it's that, been a while, yeah, sorry, yeah, since I heard that. Right. Yep. And and at that point, they were selling you know individual models, no textures. They controlled everything. It was unbelievably expensive. They had that really thick, beautiful catalog, but mm-hmm. it it was they were definitely trying to control the entire space. Where we went, okay, let's let artists who have all this content that they're building publish it for sale. And so we built that as kind of the platform, not as one of these things where it was a curated garden right out of the gate. It was just we've got to get content on it. I mean, we had companies like Rhythm and Hughes at the time published Babe the Pig Mm -hmm. and um, the Coca-Cola Polar Bears and things like that were on TurboSquid. I I think they may even still, eh, they're probably not anymore, but they were at the time um, to help kind of push the the community. And it um, it was a challenge. 
And over the first, I guess, five or six years, so after Katrina, you know, even in 2005, we started looking at and talking to the customers more. And, you know, you'd get a fair number of returns and we'd watch the returns growing mm -hmm. because you got what you paid for and you never were sure because every, everyone did things in a very different way. And it was, it was tough on customers. It was tough on artists. It was tough on our support folks. And so we started to try and look at how we could improve that and improve the relationship with both the artists and the customers. Because everyone got frustrated when you get a return. Somebody's like, this model just is broken. It's missing textures. It's got a plug-in dependency. It's got, yeah. and no one knew anything. And so we started to work on kind of a certification system. And at the time, we were looking at kind of very, very high end. And then we started talking to both artists and customers and over about two and a half years, we kind of refined this thing down to what the industry needed at the time. And it took, it took a lot of effort to get there, to, to build up a, a spec and tools that could actually support it and a, and a process that might actually work. And then we rolled it out. We ended up calling it Checkmate. Mm -hmm. And we rolled it out at SIGGRAPH in Vancouver in 2011, so four years ago. And we had a small 20 minute tech talk up there and we figured, oh, we'll get 20 of our closest friends to come and sit in and, you know, we'll go out and have beers afterwards. Yeah. And we walked into the room and it was standing room only 300 plus people. Wow. And we were like, oh shit, now what? <laughs> and so they presented the, the, the specification and everybody seemed to be really excited about it. And then afterwards we had Boeing and we had DreamWorks Animation come up to us afterwards, and they were like, can you get industry support for this standard? And we're like, well, that's the whole point, and that's what we're working on, but why does it matter to you guys? You guys are radically different shops. You're very closed pipelines. You have your own way of doing things. Why does this matter to you? Mm -hmm. And they looked at us, and they said, because our artists are lazy. <laughs> they tend to like to cut as many corners as they can under production, and it breaks our process. So they'll drop a model into the pipeline and it works up until that first change. And then the model has to come out and suddenly because of the shortcuts, it causes delays. Yep. And like if we can point to that, to your standard and say, if you can build to this, then your models will work in our pipeline and it makes our lives easier. I was like, okay, that's actually something really, really important. And plus beyond that, when we were interviewing our customers, they were saying that, if they would actually be willing to pay more for a model that they knew had been certified. And I, you know, I don't know many industries where people are like, oh, yeah, I'll pay more for that. Mm -hmm. um, if you just do this little bit extra. Well, like I'll just intervene and say that, um, you know, especially if you've managed shows before or you produce shows like, uh, you know, you, you purchasing something, let alone having artists touch it. I instantly cost money and it makes total sense. Like, um, you know, I, I'm always going to pay for something that I know is actually going to be, um, you know, what I want. Like I was having this conversation about Barbie dolls last night that, um, uh, that my, <laughs> oh, girl, okay. my girlfriend, nope. my girlfriend was talking about, uh, <laughs> buying this like, uh, exclusive, um, you know, limited edition Barbie doll and then receiving it is nothing like the Barbie doll she ordered. And it says down the bottom in fine print, like may not be, you know, exactly the same. And it's just like hideously different. Oh, and, man. but that's the thing is like, you know, when everything costs money, like even opening a file technically is going to cost you money. Um, right. having to go through and, you know, check things and be like, okay, this isn't going to work. Like you're losing so much time uh, as well as cash in, in the meantime. So having that quality assurance, I think is so drastic that paying a little bit more and knowing that you're going to get what you, you know, actually need, uh, right. it's, it's priceless. Well, I mean, it was, it was, it was kind of eye opening to say the least, but I mean, a lot of this stuff is really common sense. It's center your model at the origin. It's build it to real world scale. I mean, I can't tell you how many models of like Eiffel towers come in at, you know, super miniature size. It's like you open that file and you don't even know where it is. And it's named like box 27 or something. I mean, it's like naming conventions. It's organization. It's clean topology. It's not using N-Gons all over the place where an artist can't, you know, a customer can't subdivide it. And, you know, the artists sometimes push back and it's like the, the issue that we have to face is like, cause they're like our clients, my clients have never asked for that. They don't care about N-Gons. And I'm like, well, that's mm -hmm. great for your clients because they know what you're providing. Yeah. I said, but ultimately what we have to do is say, 
there is no way for us to anticipate whose pipeline the content is going into and what their needs are going to be. So you have to boil things down to their most effective and the most generic that you can in order to make sure that the model will work in pretty much any pipeline. Because, you know, and then we assembled the, the advisory board for mm -hmm. Checkmate. And that's, you know, Weta Digital and Blur and CNN and Neoscape and Electronic Arts and um, Refuge VFX and Ikea and Digital Tutors and, uh, um, God, your brain, <laughs> stupid, just old man, dumb. But, um, that, that, but, that but it's all these like different really industries. Great but, but all these different industries. I mean, we wanted a cross-section of film and television and games and architecture and mm -hmm. news and motion graphics. And again, we fly these guys down once a year and we sit down for two or three days and it's a blast because they're all talking about what they're all working on. It's radically different. They're showing reels. And of course, James from, from Weta will always go last. He's kind of like, yeah, this is kind of what we're working on. And <laughs> people watch it and their jaws kind of bounce and everyone's like, okay, you win. Yeah. You know, but it's, it's, it's a lot of fun, but the industry's changing too. So everyone thinks, oh, it's a checkmate spec and it's done. It's like, it's, you're shooting a moving target. So for me, it's always trying to figure out what's next. What, how's a pipeline evolving? And, and that ends up coming back. I mean, to date, you know, as of today, I think our checkmate library only represents about seven or 8% of our overall catalog. So it's a small percentage. It's already accounting for over 25% of our sales. Wow. So people, it matters. I mean, to them, it matters too. To the customers, it matters. And, and so we're trying to, to let artists know because the other side of it is, is that the artists want the sales. And so they're, you know, fighting each other for pricing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so they're racing to the bottom. We're like, no, 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 no. You don't understand is that your time is valuable. You know, you're, what you're putting, putting into this and your passion has monetary value. Don't, diminish it by pricing a model at 10 bucks. Yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, is, is this model that you spent three hours on only worth $6 to you? I mean, what would you charge a client? Kind of find that nice medium. It's, you know, and I know that the visual effects industry I know is, is in turmoil because of the fact that they get squeezed so hard on how much they can bid and, and things like that. And, um, it's unfortunate because the amount of work that it takes to be a good 3d model or a good 3d artist it's not insignificant, especially no. if you want to be good at it. So, I mean, even for the stock content guys, we're, we're trying to make sure that the artists understand that they have value and, you know, we, we communicate with them all the time. We're trying to, to help make their lives easier. We're trying to build new tools for them. All sorts of good stuff is going on at Turbo Squid for that, you know, for that very reason is, is that they're, they're doing amazing stuff and it's harder to get stuff that, that looks, you know, photo reel mm -hmm. and that's what people are asking for and so it's going to cost more what's the most expensive model i was just thinking on uh, terra squid right now oh my god um <laughs> i know i know we have a couple of like very highly detailed anatomy models right right guys like plastic boy and whatnot that are a couple of thousand bucks um but again if, you, if you're making something like that like doing from scratch is going to cost you like tens of thousands so oh yeah, yeah. There, we had a guy published another one yesterday i think and it's it, i cannot remember who the artist is but he's he's charging about two thousand dollars for it but he built custom controls into it too so you can partially fade the skin layer and see the muscles or turn the muscles off and have the nervous system or it's like all of the the anatomy systems are there i mean it's crazy and he's like oh it took me a year and a half to build this <laughs> Yeah. So and off and on. I mean, obviously not doing it full time, but obviously. so yeah. some of these things are, yeah, and they're worth every penny at that point. So, yeah. but I mean, it also is saving that $2,000 of, you know, how much pain are you saving a, a customer mm -hmm. as well? I mean, if you're in production and it's funny as we've surveyed our customers, like what's the number one reason why you come to Turbo Squid? And they're, uh, I think to a man, everyone's like under a soul crushing deadline with no hope of escape. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's like this is where we're their you know the kind of the the secret weapon in their arsenal to try and help help them make more money and save time in their productions because once you own that model then you can use it over and over and over again for any production that you have absolutely so i mean it was interesting this past summer where or was it last summer this summer the guardians of the galaxy came out we realized turbo squid got a credit Wow. A special thanks. We had no idea who gave it to us. <laughs> We're like, that's awesome. 
That's really cool. So yeah, as I think it turned out that it was um, Method Studios. I think gave it mm-hmm. to us. Cool. That's um, great. But yeah, so we're finally getting a little bit of a a spotlight shined on us, which is nice. You you guys deserve it. So that's cool. And uh, I want to be you know careful with your your time. So I'll, I'll just drop into a couple more things and we'll start to wrap it up. But obviously mm-hmm. one of the big ones that um, you know we were talking about years ago, and uh, I guess now it's it's starting to finally uh, see the surface and start kicking butt is the um, pixel squid. Oh yeah, yeah. That's that's been a fun project that we've been working on for about two and a half years as well. Is that you know part of the part of my mandate and part of the company's mandate is to find different ways for the artists to make money. And we've we've chased some pretty dry wells in our in our time trying to figure out how can we leverage the 3D content for the artists and make it accessible to audiences that may or may not have either known about it or known they needed it until now. Right. And you know we we worked with Adobe for a while on their 3D side since CS three, four, and five when they first introduced the 3D. And turns out that there was some some limitations in the way that they had implemented it that we couldn't really certify for. And we tried desperately to make 3D content certifiable for Photoshop, and we couldn't. And we figured out other ways to make that work. And Pixel Squid is really the result of that, where we we know that you know stock photography is a big thing. You know, you've got iStock, you've got Shutterstock, you've got now Adobe Stock. They they bought Photolia. You've got all these companies that need stock imagery. But the thing is, is that if you follow that whole industry, no one wants to use the same stuff. And so, sort you know, sourcing original, good-looking stuff. If you're doing an office building and you need a you know a special a specific type of lamp you've got to try and one find it and then find it at the right angle and then hope to god that nobody else has ever used it in one of their productions or mm-hmm. you know and we were like well wait a second we were starting to get a lot of agencies calling us and saying i really love the image of this model on your website can i just buy the image and we're like well n- no not <laughs> not like this it's really that's not what the artist is selling but then it struck us that we could take the photo real nature of it and we we created basically spinnable 3D objects inside of Photoshop. So we now have a plugin for Photoshop that will open up this kind of an atlas. It's a full turntable that not only spins in one axis, but it'll spin up and down and so you can get the right angle and it's pushing the imagery into your comp inside of Photoshop mm-hmm. so that um, a Photoshop artist can can look and find a unique angle, find the the right angle for it, all interactively, all in their their work. And then when they're ready, they hit download. And instead of pushing a 3D model to them, we actually have generated um, custom, very advanced layered PSD files that have pixel perfect masking. I mean, wow. we did validation where the guys were like, we spend half our days just trying to clip pads and get something, extract the the element that we want out of the background. So, I mean, with 3D, you've got all the advantages of having that, plus we have layered lighting. So you get a diffuse pass, you get a lighting pass, you get reflection, you get shine, so that you can tune your lighting even. That's right. To match it's things. like having a built-in shader editor inside of Photoshop. You can add more reflection or tone back the spec and, you know. Right, exactly. Yeah. So if, you're, if you have a submarine, we even have, you know, uh, we push the Z-depth. As a, as a pass as well, so that you can do that and just push the submarine in, you know, have it tint to dark blue so that it appears to be coming out of the background. And, mm-hmm. you know, the shadow layer itself is its own separate pass, which is interesting because it's not clipped by the object. We actually turn the object off, but the object full shadow renders. Mm-hmm. So you can move the shadow relative to it without actually have, losing anything or having the, the object clip it. Um, and then you can color tint it and do things in the, the, the 2d community seems to, we, we had a booth at Adobe max last month and it was a huge hit. We were mobbed. Um, of course it doesn't hurt that we had partnered with, with Wacom Mm -hmm. a little bit to have one of their 27 inch touch HD, uh, Cintiqs there. And of course everything is interactive as far as touching goes just to turn the objects. 
And that workflow together is pretty special. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you, you look like we, Tony Stark sitting in front of Photoshop. <laughs> yeah, at some point, and we we even bought one for the office because we're like, this is actually really cool, and we need to just keep testing it that way and pushing. Mm -hmm. That that is kind of a dual solution works out really really well for everybody too. So that's great. We're, so we're continuing to grow that pipeline and get more artists involved there um, because we didn't want. You know, and a lot of artists were like, well, how, how come I'm not partic participating in Pixel Squid? This is like, well, the workflow hadn't been completely ironed out, and we didn't want to distract you from doing stuff that already makes you money. Yeah. And so there's this balance that we had to kind of strike in terms of figuring out how that all works. But, um, so but we're, now, now sorry, the inventory is probably going to blow up because now it's out. You know, you'll get a lot more people jumping on. And, and, and we're doing themes as well so that you can do things – with 3D that you couldn't do with traditional stock photography anyway, in that now you've got a breaking pane of glass that I can rotate in any angle that I want and insert it into my comp and then clip out whatever pieces and shards I don't want. And I get exactly what I need. So you get these kind of bullet time effects. We have explosions, we have smoke, we have pouring liquids. You get all these kinds of things that you can interactively turn around and, and do some really cool stuff. And it's just, the sky is the limit at this point. So it's, it's going to be fun. The, the Photoshop community seems to be really happy with it. Of course, everything is completely free. We want people to experience it and download it and play with it and give us feedback and tell us what they need. And I mean, we have a pretty large 3d library. Now it's a matter of trying to start getting that stuff into the pixel squid format as needed and mm -hmm. getting more artists involved. So cool. Yeah, it's really fun. That's awesome, man. Well, um, is there, just uh, off the top of my head, is there anything else that you can think of you want to add to that? Or um, uh, in addition, is there any links and other stuff that we can put out so that way people can find both uh, Terra Squid's website and other, you know, whatever other information or links that you want to provide? Well, certainly. I mean, TurboSquid is just TurboSquid.com, all easy. one word. And then PixelSquid is exactly as you would imagine, PixelSquid.com. Mm -hmm. um, they're both you know, free to sign up and work through. Um, you know, Our artists have their own portal now called Squid.io, mm -hmm. S-Q-U-I-D.io. It's where all of our artists go now to, to publish their stuff, both for PixelSquid and for TurboSquid. Um, we, you know, for our artists, we have a, a V-Ray library that we've built that works specifically for pixel squid content so that it separates out when you, when you do the rendering and all the render passes. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, it's good. We've got our, you know, it's got our checkmate spec there so that people can learn how to build content. And that's, you know, it's interesting is, is that that's one thing I would say is artists that are interested in, in working professionally, try and publish a model to checkmate standard, to the checkmate pro standard. Mm -hmm. If you can do that, not only can you use it as a portfolio piece because you'll know that it would work in somebody's production pipeline, but that you you know you can use that as almost your online portfolio at some point as well. Just say, hey, look, I've got models that are selling on TurboSquid too. It's kind of like being Autodesk certified. You can say that you're uh, Pixel Squid certified in terms of um, you know yeah. etiquette, <laughs> keeping your your shit clean. Right, exactly. And yeah, who knows where the uh, where the checkmate spec is going to go next? But we'll have, we'll have a meeting with those guys next year and figure out what's uh, what's what's next on the the roadmap for the evolution of 3D. It's like I said, it's it's fun. It's never dull, um, and anyone who wants to participate and be part of the community is welcome to join. As far as I'm concerned, that's awesome, man. That's really great. Well, stick around after the call, but we'll wrap things okay. up. Um, now, this has been really great, man. So uh, ah, it's been an honor. Thanks. I just wanted to thank you, and you it's know, been too long since we talked, too. So yeah, it's we, good to catch up. We need the beer. I'll uh, I'll get Absolutely. my I'll get my ass over there at some point. <laughs> <laughs> Fine, that sounds good. There are a couple of good breweries that I can bring you to now. Nice. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I'm just going to mention a couple of things really quick. One is next episode we'll be interviewing the RealFlow development team uh, all the way in Madrid in Spain. Um, and we'll just be talking about uh, a lot of their history as well as stuff they've been doing. Um, the episode after that's going to be my talk from Paris last year. Well, sorry, this year. Um, and that's, you know, a really insightful one. It's just me throwing out a lot of content as much as I could in a small amount of time, as well as with the hangover I had. Um, but that should be really insightful. And after that, I've got a bunch of really cool ones coming up, some really great interviews, as well as a lot of ones I want to tailor specifically to December being the end of the year. I want us to start figuring out our goals for next year and also start to kind of 
really um, become accountable for that. So there's a lot of things I'm going to be putting out. Um, there's one episode I want to do, which might sound a little bit weird, but I basically want to put together a entire episode about programming for artists and kind of working around the kind of the big uh, mindsets and roadblocks that a lot of us put up about that. Because I think a lot of us kind of think, oh, you know, I'm not a programmer, that's not my thing, or that doesn't benefit me, or whatever. And I really want to kind of talk about this because I've never considered myself a programmer. I suck at math. I never went to school, but um, I managed to pick it up uh, really easily once I figured out some of the, the little mindsets that are very different. Usually when you're doing programming or when you try and start, the information people give you is really alienating. And I want to come at it from a artist point of view. Okay. And I want to show a few different ways that I was able to pick it up effortlessly. And from there, uh, it has changed my whole life in terms of how I work. I still work as an artist. I'm not someone who's going to sit down and be doing crazy equations. I cannot even do that stuff, but there's never been anything that I've never been able to do just by sitting down and, uh, and figuring it out using these mindsets that I want to share. Uh, so th there's a lot coming up. There's some really cool interviews coming up. And in addition to that, I'm just going to mention, like I said before, I'm going to start doing some Periscope episodes to kind of just play around with this platform. I want to see what it's like. It's by the same people as Twitter. So if you have a Twitter login, you don't need to sign up or anything. You just install the uh, Periscope app from your app store and log in as you would with your Twitter handle. Um, add me, my handle is Alan F T McKay. So A L L A N F T M C K A Y. Uh, and in addition to that, get on my insiders list. This is really important because I have so much stuff coming up that will be really valuable. And for all of you that do want to get into the mentorship, um, this would be your real chance to be able to get in because I'm going to be announcing that in a couple of weeks and it'll be a very short window. So to get on that, just go to alanmckay.com slash inside and you'll get on the insiders list. I have so much stuff I'm going to be giving away, really great content coming up. So uh, yeah, really worth it. Even if you uh, don't do 3D or anything, there's just so much valuable stuff on there that... Um, I'll be sending out to you. So that is it for now. Please leave a comment. If you want, check out the show notes at www.alamckay.com slash 48. So 48. And um, I'd love to hear from you and I'll definitely read them and I'll do my best to reply. Thanks again, guys. And I'll talk to you soon.